You've got to hit got it. You can't switch to this video. You'll have to unmute yourself though. Two minutes. Yep. Oh, you know, I got that as well. Piers, are you also running the? Uh, I'm giving a talk tonight. For the uh, physics in the city. Could you say something, John, please? Hello. Brilliant. Thanks. Oh, wait, I have, excuse me. I have the wrong talk. I just ah. realized. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving two talks today, and uh, one is for this and one is for the Lee's conference. So I was just thinking, wait a minute, why is Piers uh, and company? <laughs> okay, sorry, give me one second. Can you see what's happening for these companies? Oh boy, okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you nicely. Thank you. There's the ICAM logo. <laughs> okay. Uh, so welcome everybody to Science in the City or Cities. Um, so there's a, a virtual audience and there's a few of us here on the island of Skye. So um, we're very honored to have uh, Jean-Pierre Paglioni uh, from the Quantum Material Center, University of Maryland as our first of two speakers this evening. Um, so Jean-Pierre uh, is, is director of the Quantum Material Center and he's uh, received numerous uh, awards, uh, a lifetime career award uh, and, and other things. And, He'll be talking to us tonight about the uh, recently discovered ferromagnetic or nearly ferromagnetic superconductor, uranium telluride. So with that, I'll hand over to you, John. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity to talk to you. I hope you can hear me well and everything's good. Please uh, feel free to interrupt me with any questions or comments as we go. Yeah, and, I should, uh, yeah. I should just add that the, uh, the talk is about 45 minutes and then 45 minutes of discussion and questions afterwards. Okay. Uh, just to warn you, I may have to leave about 15 minutes earlier than that, but because uh, I fine. have to pick up my kids, but we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully I can answer all questions within that time. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's begin. Um, so this is work uh, that's supported by uh, a few different funding agencies, including the Moore Foundation, uh, Air Force of, uh, Office of Scientific Research, um, NSF, and Department of Energy. And uh, of course, we've had a nice long collaboration, long standing, uh, uh, I should say, uh, relationship with ICAM that has supported several things we do here, including running our winter school uh, every January. So if I, I think I put a slide in there, but I'll, I'll advertise it at the end again, anyways. Um, <clears throat> okay, so 
uranium telluride, where do we begin? My gosh, it's been a couple of years now, but there's been uh, lots of interesting articles, developments, news pieces, and so on. I'm just flashing a few key things here. Uh, this is all either uh, articles or news pieces related to the work we've done. Um, it's been quite a fun journey. <laughs> and we've got, we've uh, attained some interesting titles along the way, such as Lazarus Superconductivity. Um, so for those of you that don't know Lazarus, Lazarus is a character in the Bible that was uh, raised from the dead. And so uh, some clever people, probably Greg Bobinger, I would imagine, <laughs> gave some hints to the uh, news desk at, uh, at the high, high Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee to write this article entitled it Lazarus Superconductivity. And that was in relation to describing the work we did to show that there's a re-entrant superconducting phase in this material at very high magnetic fields, in fact, unprecedentedly high magnetic fields. Uh, and so, you know, I just uh, spent a minute on Google to look up Lazarus and found some interesting artwork, of course, but also uh, you can, I, I didn't know, but you can visit Lazarus's tomb, apparent, apparently the tomb of Lazarus in the West Bank. It's right here, you go in this little door and I guess that's where the tomb was. Uh, so anyways, I'm honored to <laughs> be given this uh, connection to Lazarus, this famous person. Anyways, so in the talk, we're gonna go through um, some different topics. I'm gonna introduce uh, just some basics of what's known about other uranium-based superconductors. There's a handful of them. Uh, and you know, as we go, I'll, I'll touch upon some relations to our current work. And then I'll go through some basic properties of uranium telluride, um, normal in superconducting state, talk about some experiments we've done over the last two years or so in high magnetic field and under high pressure. And of course, some other groups have been working on this as well. Uh, and then uh, more pointedly talk about the superconducting gap structure that we've been working on determining, as well as, excuse me, as well as some novel properties of this material that point to some very exotic, potentially exotic uh, ground state in this material that might be topological. So uh, without going, I can't go forward without acknowledging all the people that have worked on this. Uh, in particular, the, the discovery was done by Shang Ren, who was then a postdoc of Nick Butch, my colleague at down the road at NIST, um, the NIST Center for Neutron Research. And we've been working closely with Nick's group over the years to study this material. And of course, there's been some seminal discoveries and measurements done at the High Field Lab, co collaboration with Dave Graff and John Singleton company. Um, some theory work, uh, uh, which I'll present by Daniel Achterberg, who have been working with quite close, closely. Um, USR work with Jeff Sonier. Andrew Ray has done some ARPES work. Uh, Aaron Kapitolnik has worked on the Kerr effect measurements, which I'll just I'll present later on. And uh, Vidya Madhavan has done some very beautiful STM work. And my colleague, Steve Onlaga at Maryland, uh, his group has worked on some microwave response, which has presented some quite peculiar experimental evidence for these novel states. And uh, pretty much my whole research group has been working on this. So I won't acknowledge everyone, but uh, uh, individually, but participating in this work. Okay, so um, to start with, uh, ferro, we, we think we're pretty sure that this material is a ferromagnetic or nearly ferromagnetic superconductor, which means that there's ferromagnetic correlations that we assume so far are involved in the pairing of the superconducting state. Um, so luckily there's some other materials that have also uh, been promoted as, as having such a situation in particular uranium-based compounds. There's only a few of them. Uh, and luckily, just before we worked on uranium tellurium two, there was this nice review article, which I point you to by Diaoki and company on these compounds, uranium-based compounds, in particular uranium germanium two, which was the first, uh, first discovered ferromagnetic superconductor and then these related ones. So just to point out the key features, this is, these are phase diagrams uh, under pressure, 
uranium geranium too is a ferromagnet below about 50 or so Kelvin. JP, uh, sorry, it looks like your slides are not advancing. It looks like a stack at the collaborator slide. Oh. Okay, can you- s For me, they okay. work. Okay. You're on, am I on the well, slide labeled ferromagnetic superconductors? For, for me, it is still collaborators. It's fine uh, for us. Yeah. Okay. So, Victor, I think it's on your end. Maybe, maybe I have a problem specifically, but yeah. everybody else is the. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, good. Okay. I'll. I'll continue, and if uh, there's still problems, please let me know. So um, hopefully you can see the phase diagrams here. So uranium geranium two is a ferromagnet, and there's no superconductivity unless you apply pressure. And then there's a pocket of superconductivity near some putative endpoint of the magnetism. Uh, and then these other compounds are actually also ferromagnetic, long range ferromagnetism below 10 Kelvin and a few Kelvin in this case. Um, but the difference is that at ambient condition, ambient pressure, they also become superconducting. So there's ferromagnets that enter a superconducting state. And in under pressure, this system, for instance, you can drive it to a, uh, as far as I understand, is a paramagnetic state that is superconducting and presumably is driven by the fluctuations that drive this phase that exists in the ferromagnetic state. Okay, so they, these all, the key is that they all go ferromagnetic before they go, they become superconductors, at least at ambient condition. Um, one other interesting aspect of these materials is that there's re-entrant superconductivity, which is an old topic, but it's very rare actually. And what that means is that when you, for instance, apply magnetic field, which usually kills superconductivity, and it does, uh, at least in the rhodium and the cobalt germanium compounds, superconductivity is killed and then re-enters. It, it pops up again, and that's extremely unusual. Now, in, in, here's the resistance, for instance, that is zero, it becomes finite, and then it goes zero again at higher field. And that's very peculiar. And then there's a few reasons a superconductor can do that. In these materials, it's thought that these pockets exist near some putative quantum critical point and therefore some fluctuations of the magnetism drive uh, this pocket of superconductivity that, that is stronger than the magnetism at this endpoint. Um, and there's actually some evidence for that, for instance, in this, uh, I believe this is NMR data, if I remember correctly, on the uranium rhodium germanium system. It shows that the one over T2 actually has a hot spot right around this range where there's high magnetic field and re-entrant superconductivity. Um, other aspect of the material is that the, uh, the ferromagnetism is fairly well explained by existing theories of quantum criticality, in particular uranium germanium two shows this nice butterfly shaped phase diagram as a function of pressure and magnetic field. Um, it's, that's uh, uh, somewhat predicted by uh, theory of a ferromagnetic uh, system being driven to quantum criticality. And so does this compound. Okay, so come, come along uranium telluride, which we stumbled upon in uh, late 2018, actually. And uh, we came across a new member of this family, which I'm pretty sure it's, you can call it a member of this family because it has some very similar properties. Although it has some key differences, which we'll go through. Um, uranium telluride itself is actually a fairly old compound. The compound itself has been known for many years. The earliest paper I came, came across is this Soviet paper from 67. Of course, none of these early works report superconductivity. So that was the new find, but they reported other properties such as, you know, paramagnetic susceptibility, resistivity that looks kind of like a condo lattice or heavy fermion system and so on. So these properties are well known, just that they had not discovered superconductivity. Um, since then, there's been, I, 
I drastically have to update the slide, the slide I keep using, but this is only four of the first few several papers. There's probably a hundred by now, or 50 at least. Uh, but our colleagues in Japan, Daioki and company, as well as Grenoble, have been doing lots of work on this component as well. So I acknowledge them for all the interesting stuff they're doing. Of course, I can't cover everything. So I'll have to touch base on, on a few things as we go. Okay, um, any questions at this point? Since um, it's hard to know if I'm talking to a uh, audience or not. I have a question. Yeah. yeah, can I? Can you say a word about what the crucial breakthrough in materials preparation was that made it possible to see the superconductivity? Yeah, that's an ongoing topic, and so, uh, so that's a good question. The there seems to be some very subtle dependence on the growth conditions um, of these crystals that gives you or doesn't give you. A superconducting state in the produced materials. So um, the crystal. So there's a few different ways you can grow these crystals. The main way that most people are using, and in fact the only way that is known to produce superconducting crystals so far, is by uh, what's called chemical vapor transport. And that's, in a nutshell, when you have an evacuated tube, you put some material on one end and you put this in a temperature gradient such that the hot end actually warms up the material and the cold end precipitates uh, via uh, essentially a, a transport reaction with some transport agent like iodine gas. It precipitates the, the same material ideally. And if, you're, if everything goes well, you actually produce single crystal material. So we grow materials like, you know, a picture of a single crystal here, here's a tube that actually hasn't even been opened yet. It shows the crystals that formed. Now, the way you do this, the temperature gradient, the amount of material, the ratio of the elements you use, um, the temperature profile, the time, all these are all variables that go into the growth. And it's known, at least we're still studying right now as we speak, uh, that if you vary some of these things, you get slightly different properties of the end member materials. Um, and apparently there's some subtle differences in the superconducting state that, are, that come about this. And we're trying to understand why that is. We don't know exactly. We, I have a feeling it may have to do with some stoichiometry. For instance, how much tellurium is in the actual compound. Maybe it's not exactly two. And that has some effect, which we don't understand yet. There's another way to grow to crystals, which is just essentially to put uranium in a big crucible full of tellurium and melt everything, the tellurium melts to a liquid, it dissolves the uranium, and then you do go through a cooling process. And, and uh, when you cool down, you can produce also uranium tellurium two crystals. So far, uh, several groups have done this and found that those crystals don't even show a superconducting phase. Uh, and they show slightly different properties, which we're still trying to understand what the differences are and why they come about. So there's, there's, this is a big open question. Okay, I hope I answered that. Um, so anyways, if you take uranium tellurium two, which I'll show you as a superconductor, as the way we grow the crystals, uh, you can put it on this putative phase diagram just in this family. And, and we suggested early on that perhaps because there's no evidence of magnetic order, it, it lives in this family at this sort of end point of ferromagnetism, where these other compounds are actually ferromagnetic and become superconductors under different conditions. So that's the, that's the relation we're proposing between these materials. Um, the crystal structure itself is shown here. It's a bit complicated to stare at, but it's uh, orthorhombic, which means the A, B, and C axes are all different. Um, but the angles are all 90 degrees. And there's a, there's a substructure which you can see with the red arrows here. The uranium, for instance, has this sort of chain structure doesn't mean that uraniums are super close together. They're actually quite far apart, but they, they exist in this quasi one dimensional substructure. And the arrows actually represent the easy axis of magnetism. So there's no magnetic order, at least to ambient pressure, but that's where the, the spins like to point when you apply magnetic field. Uh, here's, it's shown again, 
And it's a little bit more clear now. You can see the uranium chains. And actually, the tellurium also shows chain-like structure going in, in a different direction, B direction, uh, whereas the uranium goes along the A direction. Uh, it's very similar to these other compounds, uranium germanium 2, uranium rhodium germanium, but uh, uh, slightly different. So for instance, the uranium have a sort of zigzag chain in these compounds, whereas it's it's uh, a straight line in the, in the uranium tellurium tube. Okay, so the basic properties of the material, uh, I already showed from these older papers that so basically reproduces the properties. So for instance, the resistivity is sort of non-metallic at higher temperatures and then dives down at below about 50 Kelvin, which is indicative of some kind of correlated state, which is a, presumably a heavy fermion state or a condo lattice type system. And the magnetic properties are anisotropic and they show the highest magnetization when you apply a field along the A axis. So that's the easy axis. And the B is the hard axis, that's the green curve here. But actually flips at, you know, as you change temperature, this, this uh, ratio of magnetizations. So this has some physics as well. Um, early on, we did a nice collaboration with Jeff Sonier at Triumph doing muon spin rotation studies. Muons are a useful tool to look for long range magnetic order and other things, of course. And so we determined early on that there's actually no, there's no long range magnetic order in this system down to, I believe it was 20 or 25 millikelvin. And so if you measure the muon relaxation rate, you see that it, it just, it, it uh, changes as you cool down, but there's no oscillatory behavior seen in the, uh, the time curves, which would indicate a magnetic order. Uh, the other thing to note is that the, the relaxation rates are huge and they are actually growing quite a lot as you cool down, which for unfortunately kind of masks some behavior you might see to be able to tell if there's time reversal symmetry breaking or not. But it also tells you that there's a very strong magnetic fluctuation that's growing as you cool down. Um, the other evidence of some kind of uh, near critical behavior is in some scaling of the magnetization data. You can see there's nice scaling with some power law here, uh, which actually agrees with a theory by uh, Belitz Kirkpatrick and Voita um, for, a, for a disordered ferromagnet. So I don't know if it really applies or not, but nevertheless, it gives you the right exponent. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, but, okay. I forgot to show also that the, the muon relaxation rate also has a, uh, a, uh, a scaling that's consistent with SCR theory for ferromagnetism. So there's, there's pretty good evidence of a near critical behavior in this system from magnetization and muon data. Okay. The, uh, the normal state band structure is. We've got a question. Yeah. Sorry, there's there's a question from uh, Jorge. Uh, would you like to ask your question, uh, Jorge? Sure, sure. Uh, no, I was just asking if you mentioned that it agrees with the scaling you would expect for a disordered ferromagnet, and that's very interesting. But I'm just wondering, do you expect this to be a disordered ferromagnet, or you know, on account of what your samples are like, and so? No. So um, at least the crystals are, are of high quality. The crystallinity is very good. Um, so I don't know what the nature of the disorder would be that would give that, that uh, consistency. And it's, and you know, across many samples, many different groups, at least the magnetization seems to be, you know, very uniform. There's, there's very no interesting. Yeah, there's no differences in, in different materials. So I, I haven't looked closely at the uh, B, uh, BKV theory to see what sensitivity there may be on disorder, for instance. I don't, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean, to first order, does, it shouldn't apply. This is not a disordered ferromagnet. We haven't purposely put in disorder to kill the ferromagnetism at all in any way. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. So the, the electronic band structure is, uh, I would say is still undetermined. And of course it's a uranium system with correlation. So that's a, that's a challenging 
uh, challenging problem. But there has been some progress even from early on, Ishizuka and company and several other groups. In particular, for instance, this paper uh, early on showed that if you do DFT work, you can show that uh, this material actually you predict to be insulating without putting any uh, correlation U in. And if you put some U in, you actually transition to a metallic state. You, you develop a Fermi surface at about U equals one. And you know, there's some argument to say that this compound is probably around U equals two. Uh, at the very least, if you po uh, call this a prediction, then it was to some degree confirmed by photo emission, which I'll show on the next slide. But there's been various groups working on this comp on this uh, um, on this problem. So we worked with Andrew Ray to do photo emission work, and they did a nice study showing actually that the uh, uh, the photo emission shows a band structure that's actually quite consistent with at least part of the DFT calculation. In particular, this uh, quasi 1D sheet system, which you know has some hybridization that gives you these sort of cylinders that go along the C-axis. And that's shown here experimentally. You can see that the theory is drawn in red and blue and the experiment is shown underneath. And the dispersions and everything seem to match that pretty well. Um, the neat thing is that, for instance, the red lines are derived from, let me see if I have this right, from the, to, uh, I'm sorry, from the uranium chains and the blue lines are derived from the tellurium chains. So these quasi 1D structures with P orbital overlap actually give you this quasi 1D electronic structure, which is seen in the experiment. So that, that part is consistent. What's unknown is, you know, where are the F electrons? And at least experimentally, Andrew's group also uh, observed what we call the Z pocket, which is a small pocket at the Z point that's uh, seems to have a, a, a narrow dispersion that looks like a heavier system and it may, is likely F derived. But it's actually a quite challenging problem, which you can ask Andrew about in terms of matrix elements and so on, and resonance of the photo emission to be able to pull this out and actually know what you're measuring. But nevertheless, they see a Fermi surface uh, that is not in the electronic structure. So that's the first hint that there's uh, some F weight somewhere. You know, so that's that's something we're still working on. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at this band structure, there's quite, you would assume there's quite strong nesting between these things, but Andrew actually has an argument, which I don't, sorry, I don't quite recall exactly what, but he has an argument for why the nesting would actually be weak in this system. Okay. So uh, to study this electronic structure, we also decided to do some very careful transport experiments to, to look at the anisotropy. So if I go back one slide, for instance. Can I just the, uh, yeah. I think Chris Pierce has a question that he'd like to ask. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let, no, I can't. Just to know, when you said the red, the red part of the bands were uranium atoms, is that uranium D bands? Uh, these are P. P bands. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm sorry. These are both P. So these are all P derived uh, pieces. Yeah. So, you know, if there is a band structure like this, you would assume it to be highly anisotropic, of course, uh, because, you know, it's basically open cylinders along the C axis. So we wanted to probe that by looking explicitly at the C axis transport. And we actually found that the C axis resistivity is almost a at least on the order of magnitude, the same as the B axis. So we were quite surprised actually that A axis is about this value and B and C are about a factor of two larger, you know, which I, I would have assumed C was much larger, but it's actually not. And this is work by my postdoc, Yun Suk, who um, did a very careful job. You can look at details in our paper uh, to do this transport experiment using uh, different geometries and, and some analysis and so on. Um, the other thing that's surprising is A and B, as I showed you before, the resistivities, you know, basically look similar. They have a slow increase and then a drop around 50 Kelvin, whereas C axis is quite different. It's metallic, first of all, and then it has a peak around 15 Kelvin, 
that's quite different. And so there's some qualitative anisotropy there too, uh, which we're still trying to understand. But there's something there that's definitely not reflected in this DFT calculation, for instance. Um, what we do think is that this transport is probably dominated by some magnetism or magnetic scattering. And that's, you can look at details in our paper about this, but for instance, if you look at the magnetoresistance, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's a minimum in the magnetoresistance around the same temperature that this peak occurs. And it also seems to match with some analysis of the magnetization, meaning there's some kind of crossover or some uh, maybe onset of short range order or near magnetism around this temperature that then gives rise to some change in scattering that we see in, only in the C axis resistivity. Okay. So um, going on, looking at the superconducting state, this is data, data we uh, reported originally and resistivity shows zero resistance at about 1.5, 1.6 Kelvin. Uh, there's a Meissner state, specific heat shows a nice feature at TC. And the night shift data, which we collaborated with uh, uh, Furukawa at Ames to show that actually there's a, uh, there's very little change in the night shift at TC when you enter the superconducting state. So that was one of the first indications of this possibly being a spin triplet superconductor because you would not, if the, if the electrons pair up with the same spin direction, essentially, you don't expect their, uh, their magnetism to change when they condense as opposed to a singlet pair up. And so the night shift not changing is consistent with the spin triplet state. Um, since then, there's been other studies, in particular on single crystal uh, samples, which show very similar properties. So for instance, Ioki and company, have. there's a few papers now uh, that show the night shift. Actually, there's a very small change. You look at this number, this is about 0.1% or less change in the night shift at TC, uh, which, you know, I don't know, that's probably within the error bars of this experiment. And uh, it's still consistent with some kind of spin triplet state. So it's the key point is that there's not a huge change in the night shift. And it's more consistent with the triplet state. Uh, What's also very consistent with a spin triplet superconductor is the fact that the uh, upper critical field is extremely high in this system. So it's anisotropic and actually follows the anisotropy of the magnetization. For instance, the A axis, when you put a field along the A axis, the HC2 is only about six Tesla and it looks like a orbital limited kind of thing. Uh, and then if you go along the other axes, it gets larger and in particular the B axis, it just shoots up and we, in our lab, we couldn't even reach the, uh, the upper critical field in our range of experiment. Uh, one of the key points is that all these upper critical fields uh, far surpass the paramagnetic limit, the Pauli limit of three Tesla or so, just given by the, the condensation energy, uh, uh, I should say the Zeeman energy of splitting the pairs. So this is another thing that's quite consistent with it being a spin triplet superconductor. And you see similar work in the other uranium compounds, for instance. Okay, uh, what was followed up on that work by the Grenoble group was to look carefully at the upper critical field, in particular in the B axis direction. And that shows, so our, our data actually is replotted here. You can see it just goes off screen and we stopped our experiment there. Uh, what they found was that if you keep going, you actually see this sort of re-entrant behavior, much like the other uranium superconductors. And not only that, but it's very sensitive to the angle of the magnetic field. So if you go several degrees off of B axis, you actually sort of quench this high field phase and you get something that's more like an orbital limited type uh, HC2. But if you're directly along B axis, you get this behavior that's you know actually increasing TC as you go up in field, and then you hit this barrier here at about 35 Tesla, which is shown here in the data. And that's thought to be a, a spin polarized magnetic phase. So there's an abrupt first order transition that cuts off the superconductivity and goes into this polarized phase. So it's interesting because you can imagine, you know, what's going to happen if you, if that phase weren't there, this superconductivity would keep 
increasing or what would happen? You know, it, it clearly has a much higher upper critical field than just 35 Tesla. Okay. And surprisingly, so we studied this, we, we went to uh, both Tallahassee and Los Alamos to do high field measurements. And so the data that I was just showing is actually situated along this axis, the B axis. And this is now angle of magnetic field along C and A going away from B. So here you see that there's a superconductivity uh, that has this sort of reentrant phase and then it gets cut off. To our surprise, if you tilted the angle away from the B axis, particularly towards the C axis, you suppress superconductivity, you enter a normal state, and then at about 40 Tesla, you re-enter a new superconducting phase that exists up to at least 60 Tesla. This is in pulse magnetic field. So that was quite a shock and quite uh, to our delight that we found this re-entrant superconducting phase that's essentially at the highest fields uh, that have ever been seen in a re-entrant phase. Um, here's some data just to show you how we saw that. Um, so uh, here's just some resistivity data, for instance. Uh, if you, when you're along the uh, B axis, it's just superconducting all the way up to 35 Tesla. This is at low temperature. And then as you tilt the field away, you see that the, you, you suppress this upper critical field. And if you go all the way to about 30 degrees or 35 degrees, here's the resistance again, you see that it becomes normal and then it goes down and goes superconducting again. So the yellow data, for instance, is at 23 degrees and it's superconducting all the way up to the, the highest field we measured. And so un unfortunately the 100 Tesla magnet is still, as far as I understand, under repairs at Los Alamos, but we, we would like to push that a little further to see what happens. Uh, this is a plot of the a simultaneous experiment using a, 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 essentially it's a susceptibility measurement using tunnel diode oscillator technique. And it's measuring the same thing. So this is just comparing B and C axis uh, field directions. And then some angle in between shows you this re-entrant phase here. And this is consistent with the diamagnetic, uh, diamagnetic change in the, in the signal. Okay. So that's high magnetic fields. Now, if you apply pressure, what happens? So when you apply pressure, TC starts at about 1.6 Kelvin. Uh, first thing to note is that it, it just about doubles. It goes up to about three Kelvin. Um, and then if you keep applying pressure, you, you quench this superconducting state and you enter some other phase, which we believe is some magnetic state. And uh, you can see, for instance, in the raw data here, what happens there. So at high, at high pressures, there's some phase transition, which is not superconductivity, but into some kind of magnetic state. Uh, this was also studied by Grenoble. And in particular, they did a specific heat measurement under pressure. And what they found was quite interesting. Excuse me. They saw not only this increase in TC, but they also saw a second phase transition at lower temperature, which suggested that the TC actually split into two. And you can see, for instance, here, the raw data. And what gives you uh, uh, confidence that this lower transition is actually superconducting is the fact that the jump in specific heat, which starts at zero pressure, goes down, that big jump. And there's another jump that develops at higher temperature. And that's where the resistance goes to zero. So these both most likely are, are superconducting transitions that have been studied, that have been measured. And then again, as I said, at higher pressures, there's some kind of MO stands for magnetically ordered. And there's a question mark there, so we don't know. <clears throat> um, can I just interrupt? I think Pierce had a question about what happened at uh, 23 degrees and 40 Teslas, what the, what, what the state was there in the normal state, I think. Uh, what happens here in the normal state? Yeah. So above TC? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, he asked, do you, do you see a heavy fermion state or something else above TC? Uh, so we don't have much data up there because this is in the pulse field regime. So for instance, getting temperature dependence and so on is uh, challenging at the very least. 
So I, and I'm not aware of any heat capacity measurements done up here yet. So it's hard to say. So, I'm, not, I'm not sure. If you, I didn't I, hear you. I, I'll repeat the, the question. So he says, do you have res resistivity measurements um, up there in the normal state? And what does that show? Uh, the, yes, I, I'm trying to remember the data. I, I don't remember anything dramatic happening because they would be magnetic field sweeps. Um, I don't think there's much that happens above this transition. I mean, there's some magneto resistance, but I don't think there's anything that we can say much about in terms of what kind of ground state there is there. There's no distinction from the FP state. Right. Uh, yeah, let, yeah, I have to check. Yeah, the short story is we don't have much data above TC because we're basically studying this state and we have to do some more experiments. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so if you focus in on this region, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, this is where the superconductivity gets sort of cut off by this magnetic state. There's actually some reentrant behavior when you apply a magnetic field. So for instance, look at the lowest temperature in black. It's in, in a normal state and actually becomes superconducting and then reenters a normal state, a higher magnetic field. And uh, so if you study that a little more carefully, uh, there's some interesting features like hysteresis, uh, as well as a very interesting sharpening of the superconducting transition as you apply increasing magnetic field. So there's this, at the very least, there's a strong interplay of this magnetic state, which we think is ferromagnetic, but it's not clear exactly what it is, and the superconductivity. Um, as a function of temperature and magnetic field and pressure. It's a bit, it's quite a rich spot right in this regime here. Um, we actually drew a sort of phase diagram which uh, represents what I'm saying here. So if you're at this, this spot where the magnetic and the superconducting phases meet and you apply magnetic field, you get a little pocket of superconductivity that sort of comes out and we think it might actually be more akin to what you see in the other uranium compounds where you suppress a magnetic state and you're near some critical point where superconductivity thrives. Um, we have to study this a little bit more carefully with other experiments, but that's, that's what we see so far. Okay, uh, it gets even richer. So <laughs> this is gonna keep us busy for a long time. So Aoki-san and company have studied this even further as a function of pressure uh, in magnetic field. And for instance, you can see up to what is believed to be four different superconducting phases in some regime of pressure and field and temperature. And these, these uh, boundaries are, are determined by specific heat measurements, if I remember correctly. So these are phase boundaries that are known, that, that are uh, bulk. So it, you know, Determining what the nature of these different phases are is going to be quite a challenge under pressure, but it's something we're trying to chase after. Um, okay, I'll just note uh, some further work we did on under pressure as well. Again, studying the sort of whole phase diagram. This is for field along the B axis, so it's not at this specific angle of 30 degrees. Um, but if, for instance, at, high, at lower pressures, the phase diagram is such that there's a superconducting phase that gets cut off by this field polarized phase. And there's some you know, remnant of this transition at higher temperatures. So this is what I mean that probably at this specific angle, there's something like this where there's, a, there's some uh, non-monotonic feature in, in uh, magneto resistance, but I'm not, I don't quite remember exactly. And if you go to higher pressure, you can see that you actually suppress this superconducting phase and then you, you reach what we think is a ferromagnetic phase, but it's some distinct phase from this polarized phase because there's actually a phase transition here. So to determine these phases, we, don't, we have to do more experiments. It's a bit challenging under pressure. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna turn to uh, 
ask a question. What's SC1 and SC2 in the last figure? Uh, yeah, so there is, uh, so from our TDO experiments, or measurements under pressure as well, we see a, a trace of a superconducting phase that lives within the superconducting phase here. So for instance, we think this is probably what, uh, if I go back several slides here, I'm sorry, here. We think that th this, there's a there's a feature at this transition between this superconducting phase and this reentering phase. So we, this is what we would call SC1 and SC2. Okay. How those two superconducting phases are different, and do you find any evidence for a phase transition between them? Yeah. So so this is what I'm talking about. So this is what you might call SC1, just this you know zero field phase. And when you apply field, there's this re-entrant behavior. And the question is, is, is there evidence for this being a distinct phase? Exactly. So what I'm saying is, as we go along this axis, we see a, we see, actually see a kink in the frequency response of the tunnel diode experiment, suggesting there's at least some change in susceptibility that suggests a phase transition there. And this is in a system where, you know, resistively it's superconducting all the way through. Okay. And then as you apply it, so if you're sitting at this point, as you apply pressure, uh, this evolves as well. And that's what it, I was showing here. So that's, you start here and you apply pressure and this gets suppressed along with this one. So these, these measurements are all made by tunnel diode resonance measurements to distinguish SC2 and SC1. Yeah, so yeah, so I think if I remember correctly, the color coding here is the resistance. So there's two, two samples and two experiments done simultaneously in the same pressure cell. So there's a resistance measurement and there's a tunnel diode measurement. So yeah, these points are determined by tunnel diode oscillator, a kink in the tunnel diode oscillator response. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here uh, from uh, Callum Stevens. Um, hi, I just wondered how much you knew about the ferromagnetic state and what evidence you had that it's, it's ferromagnetism, like what variety of measurement? You said ferromagnetic, right? Yes, the FM state. Yeah, so this state or the uh, polarized state? Um, so, the green. The green state. So we, we said ferromagnetic because if you look at the, I don't, sorry, I don't have the, yeah, I don't have the data here, but if you look, uh, for instance, if you look at the tunnel diode response, which is, a, you know, it's akin to magnetic susceptibility, the magnetic susceptibility jumps up when you hit this phase boundary. And th this is like ground state, this is low temperature. So if you're, if, you're, if you're decreasing field and you're looking at the susceptibility response, it jumps up at this point into this phase. So at least it has more susceptibility than, than this polarized phase. And then how, you know, how to connect these three phases, we don't know. And that's why we drew some you know, dashed lines here. It really depends on some details of these phases. Okay. So uh, now I'll move on to talking a bit about what we know about the superconducting state uh, gap structure and symmetry. Uh, so we measured uh, thermal transport in Maryland here of crystals. And I'm showing here two different crystals that were prepared such that heat currents would be sent along A and B axes, which essentially give the same result, but it was just a, a detailed study. So you can see the thermal conductivity here actually has some feature at TC, which is not always nice to see. You can see at about 1.5 Kelvin, there's an increase in the thermal conductivity. And that's indicative of a quite high quality crystalline behavior because 
this, this at least to some degree has some phonon transport in it. And when you see that, that's a signature that you have quite high quality uh, or high quality lattice that's giving you an increase in the phonon heat transport because of the loss of electrons. And then you suppress it as with a little bit of magnetic field because you introduce vortices and you introduce scattering of the phonons. There could be some electron transport in here as well. It's not clear exactly how to distinguish the two. Um, so the other thing to start off with is that if you just, this is for fields directed along the A axis where we can achieve HC2 at low fields. And when you go to the normal state, we recover vitamin Franz law with an error bar here. So it shows that, you know, everything is, is okay. Uh, our contacts, everything, the, the experiment is, is uh, seeing what it's supposed to see. So these are measurements using the same sample, same contacts, measure the resi electrical resistance, thermal resistance and compare, and you get the vitamin Franz law result. Um, so now if we take these samples and we look at the heat transport in the zero temperature limit as a function of magnetic field. So in zero magnetic field, that's the blue curve here. You see that the thermal conductivity, um, the T linear component is going to zero in both samples. And then as you apply magnetic field, it rises quite rapidly towards the normal state value, which is shown here. Um, so then if you plot this extrapolation of these fairly straight lines on this plot here, that's the quote unquote zero temperature extrapolation. And you can see as a function of reduced magnetic field, uh, that's the red and the blue points. And it, you see that there's a quite rapid rise in the thermal conductivity up to HC2. And that's quite consistent with a, a nodal superconductor as opposed to a fully gap superconductor like niobium here. Okay, and it's actually quite similar to uranium platinum three, for instance, which is shown in green here. Okay, so that's the first uh, indication of this being a nodal superconductor or a, a superconductor that has a order parameter with nodes in the gap structure. So Pierce, before you change slides, um, Pierce wanted to know um, what happens to the heat capacity that goes along with this? In a magnetic field. Yeah, in, uh, in a magnetic uh, field. I'll show that uh, in a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah, so meaning the field, the field evolution at zero temperature limit, is that what you mean? Or just in general? Yeah, I, I wanted to know whether you recover the full normal state resistive, uh, the, the full normal state specific heat in a magnetic field. Um, yeah, so as you know, there's a, there's a big upturn at low temperatures, and that remains as you go above HC2. So I'll show you some data, I think. Okay, Sven Friedemann also had a question. Yeah, would you like to come and ask your question, Sven? I guess that's going to be um, answered when he's going to show the specific heat. Yeah, I was about to sum up your content. Okay, if you continue, we'll come back to it. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this. This is just comparison, comparing the anisotropy, which, uh, for instance, if you because we have A and B axis heat currents, we can compare the, uh, the, the ratio of the two by normalizing to the normal state ratio, which would tell you, it can tell you details about the anisotropy of the superconducting gap itself. Uh, but to understand what that means, you need some microscopic model, which is also the case in these other superconductors, for instance. But it's quite, it's, a, it's about 80% towards the B direction, at least from these experiments. But this is a 3D system, so you have to measure C as well to know. Um, so my colleague, Steve Onlaga, and his group also measured using a microwave technique, the penetration depth down to low temperatures, and it's shown here. These are two different samples, and you see quite nicely that they're nicely quadratic in temperature dependence uh, down to very low temperature, which suggests that there's point nodes. So not only nodes, but point, point type nodes in the gap structure. This is a fairly clean result. There's no, not really any ambiguity to it. So it's a nice result. Uh, so now regarding the specific heat, uh, 
in our first report, we noted that, so we had specific heat measurements down to helium three temperature or so. And we noted that there was a quite peculiar residual value, if you extrapolate this, of about half of the normal state, which gamma is about here, it's about 120. And this was about 50 or 60, which we thought originally was an indication that this might actually be a half gap superconductor akin to, uh, to superfluid helium. Um, but since then, we've actually studied it more carefully into lower temperatures, uh, actually quite some time ago, and found that not only is there a residual, quote unquote, residual value, but there's actually an upturn as you go to lower temperatures. And so originally we thought, well, this is probably just some nuclear shock key term, but we actually studied an isotopically pure sample and it has exactly the same upturn. So to this day, we're not quite sure what the, the the nature of this upturn or origin of it is. Um, and I don't think I, yeah, I, sorry, I don't have the magnetic field dependence, Pierce, but uh, I can draw it, I guess. Can you just say why those two curves are the same? They look different to me, the red curves and the blue curves. Um, red curve drops at low temperature and the blue curve. Oh, this? Yeah. Uh, no, I think these are spurious points. I mean, okay, I don't, I don't have a plot to expand, but these are some spurious points at the lowest temperature. But you can see quite clearly, you know, there's quite a few data points that are turning up like that. So I say it's nearly identical because the, you know, there's no, these aren't normalized or anything. These are actual measurements of different samples. And when you say U two three eight, do you mean depleted uranium, or do you? mean really U238 and no 235 at all? I mean depleted uranium. So it's, yeah, so this is uh, of the order of, I think it's less than 1% of non-238. Yeah. There's a question from York A as well. Would it, okay, would you like to unmute and ask? Sure, no problem. Uh, now the question was just simply, if the lowest point on that curve, does it go below gamma halves? or does it stay above gamma divided by two? The lowest point here? The lowest point. So uh, gamma, yeah, is, the... gamma is somewhere here. You know, okay, you... so it's, but, yeah, but the axis, the axis doesn't start at zero. So you find it hard to, yeah, to work but there's, it out. There's been other measurements, including um, a paper that just came out by, uh, the Ioki group that shows that this upturn, if you go to lower temperature, actually goes quite goes up to at least 200. It goes up here somewhere. Yeah. Quite... Now what I was wondering is if you can still understand that curve as the one you thought originally, plus another term that goes up as you lower the temperature. So meaning something or like not. this plus, yeah. Yeah, because if it goes below gamma halves, then that wouldn't make sense. But if it stays always above gamma halves, it might be the sum of two different tendencies. Yeah, so good question. So the, the first problem is that, uh, oh, I should, sorry, I have to. I have to clear all this, okay. The first problem actually is that if, okay, even if you take this picture on the left, you can clearly see that the entropy is not conserved here, right? And even if you take this upturn, it's actually even worse, right? If you take mm -hmm. the, so that's the first problem, and uh, yeah. that's what made us do, you know, do some analysis of this. And this is actually in our paper with the thermal transport. Uh, so here's the same data. Um, and so now, if you actually just assume that this is some, you know, nothing to do with electrons, it's some upturn, whether it's some divergence or what have you, but we just fit it. And we fit it to some power law behavior, which is, I think it's T to the minus one third, some weak power law, and then subtract it. Then we get this curve here. And actually that curve uh, shown just versus T squared here is now balancing the entropy. So, you know, whatever, uh, whatever this weight is here, if you remove it, then you recover entropy balance. So I think that's a quite significant, yeah. you know, factor to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that the, I forgot to say these two samples are actually the 
samples we measured the thermal transport on. So, so if you go back to this thermal transport data, you know, this is clearly going to zero at zero temperature, which means there's no, there's very little at least, you know, maybe the limit would be if this saturates here, there's very little um, uh, fermionic heat transport. And yet there's this big upturn in the, the specific heat. So, so there's uh, a Sorry, Our conclusion is that, that these are some kind of localized states. Yeah, there's, thank a, question, you. Yeah, there's a question from Pierce relating to this. He asks, um, is this same um, signal that you subtracted present when you apply a magnetic field that suppresses superconductivity? Yeah, so I was going to, I don't have the data, but I was going to draw it for you. If you trust me, you trust me, right, Pierce? Yeah, I think he trusts you. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah, this, this thing, when you apply above HC2, it looks something like this, and then it, 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 it has the same upturn. It changes in form a little bit, but it's basically the same. So there's an upturn here, even above HC2. Is that your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. If I can dig up the data, I'll, I'll send... Uh, I'll send you a copy. Um, okay. So, you know, this is an interesting question what this upturn is, you know, the simplest explanation would be is that it's some nuclear shock heat term, uh, which has to be due to less than 1% of uranium impurities that are not 238, which doesn't have any nuclear dipole or quadrupole, nuclear dipole or quadrupole moments. Uh, at least according to our numbers, it can't, it can't account for this upturn with such a small amount, given that the upturn starts at least at about 300 millikelvin. So you need quite a large splitting and it doesn't, doesn't make sense given the magnitude of the impurities. But who knows? Okay, so, uh, okay, the last part, uh, I'm gonna talk about some interesting observations, first by videos group, uh, at Urbana doing STM. Uh, so she, uh, her group did some nice STM work. You can see the topograph here showing nice atomic resolution. She sees all, these are all tellurium atoms she sees in the, in the topograph here. This, this, the surface she's observing is along this cleave plane, which is, I believe is 011, one of the natural cleave planes. I'm not gonna go through details of this, not my experiment, but uh, the first thing she sees is on a large energy scale, there's a, a Fano-like line shape, which is consistent with it, uh, uh, about a, uh, a five MeV uh, condo lattice or hybridization energy scale, which if I remember correctly, goes away at about 50 Kelvin, just like in the resistivity, that's where the onset of the uh, condo behavior starts. At very small energy scales, she sees the very peculiar features. First of all, there's a gap-like feature that, that's consistent with superconductivity, but it's very, very shallow. You see, this is only about, you know, in some units about 90% or sorry, 10% depression, which is not nearly a full gap. And that's quite peculiar because this is a nice bulk superconductor. Um, the other thing is that when uh, when they change the tip position from this position, which is on the tellurium, one of the tellurium atoms, to going in between these other two, so it's tellurium one to in between tellurium two, uh, there's actually a transfer of this sort of spectral weight from the large energy scale fanal like line shape to the superconducting gap. So there's like a trade off or a competition of the hybridization scale and the superconducting uh, uh, gap uh, uh, depth. So that's quite interesting. And one of the probably the most interesting things in this whole experiment was when they looked at step edges to see that when you bring the tip towards a step edge, which is shown here, there's a peculiar shape that looks looks like a fano shape, but it's actually some symmetric type shape. And when you look at the 
the joining step edge that's its opposite in, in going up versus down, this line shape actually flips. So there's some kind of chirality, uh, at least in this picture or this range of view uh, from the up step edge and the down step edge. And they so they went on to suggest that this is evidence of some kind of chiral superconducting state, especially because these features all go away when you either raise the temperature, which is shown here, or you increase magnetic field up to HC2. So they're all associated with the superconducting state. So uh, their paper, I believe, is called the Chiral Superconducting State in Uranium Telluride. You can see the Nature paper for more details. OK, so uh, to bring this sort of full circle, coming back to Steve Onlog's experiment of the microwave impedance, which is what he used to extract the penetration depth. Um, when they looked at this data in more detail, of course, they have the real, the total real and imaginary parts of the magnetic impedance that they can look at. What they noticed right away is that the, for instance, the real part is nowhere near zero resistance. In a superconductor, this should go to very near zero. And there's quite a large residual value here. And so that was peculiar. And so if you convert this to uh, conductivity units, um, you can see that there's something very, very strange. So sigma one, for instance, the real part, uh, of uranium telluride actually goes up as you go below TC. And as compared to other superconductors where, for instance, titanium is S-wave, it goes up, but then it of course goes to zero. And uh, even in a D-wave superconductor like 115s, you know, there's some residual, apparent residual value, but it's quite small. So there's something very strange here. Uh, they analyzed this data in terms of two fluid model, just assuming that there's some normal quasi particles there. And if you do that, you get something like a 60% fraction of the measured quasi particle response. So you got to remember that this is a microwave experiment. They're measuring some depth into the material, which is neither fully surface nor fully bulk. It's somewhere in between, but it's a fairly shallow, you know, let's say a micron or something like that. See you on Thursday. Okay, and uh, <laughs> so this is quite peculiar, especially because if they're seeing a normal quasi-particle response, you have to keep in mind these other experiments, which I was telling you about, particularly the thermal conductivity, which suggests that there's no bulk residual quasi-particles in the zero temperature limit, as shown here, you know, just this red data here, which goes to zero. So there's, a, there's some conundrum here. There's no bulk quasi-particles in the zero temperature limit. Uh, whereas STM data shows you know, quite a large density of states at zero bias. And the microwave response shows quite a large response of quasi-particles uh, in the zero temperature limit of normal state quasi-particles. And I should say, these have to be charged quasi-particles because this is an electromagnetic response. So, okay, well, you put these things together and you have to conclude something. And so our proposal so far is that there's probably some normal fluid on the surface, which would explain why STM sees some density of states and why the microwave experiment sees some uh, uh, normal quasi-particle response in the zero temperature limit, whereas the thermal conductivity sees nothing. So, uh, you know, this has to be worked out, but for instance, it's been proposed by Liang Fu many times, but uh, that uh, there, you know, uh, some form of topological superconductor would have a Meyer on a fluid on, this, on its surface. And for instance, that could be the case here. Okay, so to finish off, um, I, we already reported this data, but in case you, maybe you had a good eye when I was showing you this isotopically pure sample, but there's some feature within the jump of the transition. If you blow that up, you actually see that there's, there's two, looks like two steps rather than one. So that was actually our first observation, just doing this experiment. Um, oh, I should say that we, we did this experiment in two different ways. One is the sort of uh, standard heat capacity method of pulsing heat and looking at the relaxation for each data point. The other way is to do a long, so-called long pulse heat, heat the sample quite a bit 
and look at a long relaxation and just look at the derivatives of that relaxation to pull out features and that's shown in the blue. So it's all consistent and it's just we get more data points doing it that way. Um, here's several samples showing the same features. So I forget which samples which, but you can see that even with slightly different TCs, there's still a double, double feature. So we were convinced that this shows evidence of a double superconducting transition that's intrinsic. Uh, again, using this continuous measurement, you can do many curves very quickly. So here's a bunch of curves at different magnetic fields. And these are two different samples here, for instance. You can see that you can track this transition uh, as you increase magnetic field and suppress TC. Uh, since then, there's been other observations of this double transition. I should remind you that under pressure, this was originally seen, if you apply pressure, you see a quite you know, distinct separation of two transitions. And so we were the first to see this at ambient pressure. And then there's uh, some uh, thermal expansion measurements that came out of Los Alamos also seeing this. So for instance, shown in this sample here, you can see the thermal expansion shows quite a quite distinct double transition. Now what's interesting, and this goes back to the question about uh, different ways of growing different crystals or crystals being showing slightly different properties. There's sample 1A here, for instance, shows no sign of a double trans, at least maybe not within this uh, zoom here. Maybe if you zoom in, you can see something different, but they don't see any sign of the double transition here. So there's clearly some sample dependence, which we're trying to understand. At least it was proposed by uh, Priscilla and company that uh, the under pressure separation of TCs may actually cross somehow and show some, some separation of TCs here. And maybe there's some axis here, which is acting like pressure such as strain. So different samples maybe have slightly different strains uh, built into them via, via either maybe the way they were grown or the way they were treated or what have you. And they lie on some different point on this axis here, perhaps that we don't know that yet. Okay, um, oh yeah, so finally, uh, we did some, we, we collaborated with Aaron Capitonic's group to study the Kerr effect to look for time reversal symmetry breaking. And, uh, you know, just not to go too much into detail on this, the long story short is they see a quite nice feature of time reversal breaking via Kerr rotation that onsets at TC. Um, as seen in you know, a few other materials, which, which are believed to have time reversal breaking at their superconducting transition. Okay, so now if we take these data all together, in particular, the evidence of nodal quasi-particles, point nodes, uh, time reversal breaking, and a uh, two component order parameter as evidenced by uh, a double superconducting transition. Uh, we worked with Daniel to figure out what the constraints are on the, on the possible uh, order parameter symmetries. And so you can see here all the possibilities for this uh, point group of the crystal. And you can see if you rule out line nodes, which doesn't seem to be consistent with the uh, thermal data, it leaves some combination of these, these uh, AU through B3U uh, EREPs. And so, Given that, plus some evidence from the magnetic field dependence of the splitting of TC uh, leads us to believe that it's probably one of these two possibilities, that there's a two component order parameter with, with combinations of two of these EREPs here. And the interesting thing is that all of these are considered uh, to have vial nodes in the order parameter. So there's a question about if you call that a topological superconductor or not, because vial nodes technically overall in the whole system are not topological, but locally they are. So there's some subtlety to how you uh, describe that, but nevertheless, I think it's safe to call it a vial superconductor if this really is the case. Meaning that the point nodes in the gap structure themselves are topological and they have some chirality of the phase that winds around and the excitations of these nodes are vile uh, uh, fermions. Okay, 
and that's in our paper that's supposed to come out sometime. Okay, uh, I won't go into that. I'll just conclude now. Uh, so I hope I conveyed some, first of all, excitement about this material and all the complexities and uh, uh, interesting observations that have been made so far. Uh, we believe it all sort of stems from this being nearly ferromagnetic, although that's up for debate, of course. There's been some recent work on neutron scattering, for instance, suggesting uh, anti-ferromagnetic fluctuations. So it's not clear what's driving uh, the, the cart, what kind of horse it is. Uh, there's certainly evidence of some very exotic re-entrant pairing that's very st stable, robust under very strong magnetic fields which at least uh, to most people suggests this is definitely a spin triplet superconductor, at least that phase is. Um, I hope I showed that our experiments have shown that there's a nodal gap structure and looks like point nodes. And that together with the other experiments such as the Kerr rotation giving evidence of time reversal breaking and the STM data showing some kind of chiral states on the surface suggests that this is a sort of form of, super, of topological superconductivity. So to figure that out in detail, of course, we need to do more experiments as always, but it's uh, been quite a nice ride so far. So thanks for your attention. And I guess we have lots of time for questions now. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. So we have some questions. I think there's one from uh, Priya Sharma. Um, would you like to unmute and ask your question, uh, Priya? Yeah. Hi. Um, I, you had lots of uh, measurements of uh, thermal, uh, thermal conductivity. I was wondering if there are any of transverse thermal conductivity, like thermal hall transport. Uh, we are working on that. Right. OK. It's Thank a you. difficult experiment. And I have no, yeah, I have nothing to report yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question here in the room from uh, Callum Stevens. Let's ask, let's ask his question. Hi, John here. Thanks for the talk. I was just wondering, a few slides back, you showed um, split superconduction transitions in four samples. Yes. Um, do you know what the difference, because S4 there has a much higher TC than the other ones. Do you know what the difference is between the S4 sample and those other ones? No, I don't. They were grown in nominally identical ways. So the just same. This, this batch mm -hmm. seemed to have slightly higher TC. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, TC is so somewhat sensitive to heating conditions like uh, maybe the, the cooling rate or, or what temperature the tube goes to. But as far as I know, these samples were grown under the same conditions, but there's always something a little bit different. I should say also, there's pr we've probably measured at least 15 different samples now or more. Yes. They all show this double transition. And there's nothing subtle in like the lattice parameters in, in the X-ray diffraction even at room temperature to tell the difference between them. No, we've been looking. There are, there are subtle differences, but nothing systematic that we've seen so far, at least comparing um, uh, X-ray refinement data on single crystal X-ray to TC variation or anything like that. There's some um, variation, but there's nothing, it's, it's very subtle. So we haven't found the, the relationship yet. And, and just a quick other question. In the, um, the uh, microwave data, the, the, the normal, um, fluid conductivity you said was uh, reaching 60% density. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Does this, does this um, correlate with the residual and heat capacity or, or are you saying that it's really hard to get a handle on the residual and heat capacity because of this upturn at low temperatures? Okay, so this fraction is is saying, you know, you assume that the, your total response is given by two separate fluids. Mm -hmm. And then the question is what fraction of each fluid is giving you what? So this normal fluid in this analysis makes up most, more than half of the response. Yeah. 
So then the question you have to ask is, well, where is this fluid that you're measuring? And as I was trying to convey, it's, it's you know, it's some skin depth into the sample because the mic microwave experiment is done, I think it's at uh, 10 gigahertz or so, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. and so it's, you know, it's not measuring the bulk of the crystal, it's measuring the outer part of it. Yeah. But then you have, to, you know, so then you have to figure out, okay, you need some other assumptions to understand, for instance, what thickness you're measuring yeah. um, and where do these fractions lie, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. There's a question from Python Hal. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrongly. Hi, uh, so I'm not sure if Python is able to unmute, so I'll ask his question. So he says, I, I want to repeat uh, your case question again, since it's not noticed. Is time reversal symmetry broken at upper or lower TC of the split transition? Can you tell? So far, we can't tell. Um, there's just not enough resolution to be able to see, you know, because the splitting is with about 5,200 millikelvin. And so that's, you know, it's about this much. So it's really hard to see. Okay, thank you very much. There's a, a question from Sven Friedemann. If you'd like to unmute and ask your question, Sven. Yes, I wonder what is known about the valency of the uranium. Can you see a fluctuating moment in the susceptibility above the superconductivity? Uh, so there has been some uh, X-ray absorption measurements done by Los Alamos. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to remember the result. Even Curry Vice, does that tell you something? Oh, okay. Well, if you if you're just talking about susceptible magnetic susceptibility, um, let's see if I go back here. Sorry, a lot of data. There it is. Oops. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> uh, if I remember, I think this line here is a Curie Weiss fit. So it's definitely Curie Weiss at higher temperatures. Okay. What moment does it correspond to? Um, I, I don't remember offhand, but it's something akin to the free uranium moment. So it's not, it's not, it it's, looks fairly local moment like. I don't remember the number. Now, at low, below this temperature, there's a deviation. You know, of course, this is not even monotonic here. Um, and this is actually what we used to try to understand the transport data. So actually, this. This quantity here in black, delta M over H, is uh, we're actually taking the susceptibility and subtracting the Curie Weiss uh, component from high temperature. So you can kind of see that it's basically, you know, above 50 Kelvin, it's going towards zero. And then below that, it's dipping down. That's what we were trying to convey that this actually um, suggests that. Uh, this is not uh, condo behavior because that would you'd expect it to go above. But this is actually some kind of, you know, I want to call it maybe short range magnetic order or some magnetic correlation that's increasing and in peaking around 10, 15 Kelvin. Okay, so definitely in this in this temperature range, you're deviating from the Curie Weiss behavior. So at least from 50 Kelvin and below, there's some condo like behavior, but I think it's even temp uh, direction dependent in some sense. So there's condo-like behavior, but there's also some kind of uh, quasi-magnetic order or near correlations. And this has been seen in other measurements like NMR, for instance. NMR one over T2 diverges around 20 Kelvin and they can't even measure it anymore. Okay, thank you very much. And while you're on these early slides, um, would, could you comment about the um, reproducibility of the ARPES data, looking at different samples or 
different surfaces. You showed a C, C axis surface, I think, and this nice square uh, or two one dimensional Fermi, Fermi surfaces. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I can't comment on reproducibility. I know Andrew has measured a few samples, but this was sort of r ramping up just before the pandemic. So I think they've been shut down for quite a while and they're probably getting back into it now. So I, yeah. So I, 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 I refer you to their paper to see what, you know, what kind of reproducibility and so on they reported back then, but I don't, I don't think they have much more to report since then. There's been other papers, but there's a, there's, there was some ARPES work reported before Andrew, but there's some subtlety to interpreting some of the data, which as you, if you're, familiar with ARPES measurements, you can understand. Okay, thank you very much. Are there more questions? Yeah, yeah I think Piers has a, another question. So. Hi, JP, thanks for a great talk. Um, what can you tell us about the high field uh, superconducting state? Um, it, presumably, it's it's is it fully pulverized at that at that field? Uh, can we be sure that the magnetic how how polarized is the electron gas at that field? Yeah, it, I mean, so what we concluded, which is just you know, you can see very clearly from staring at this phase diagram, is that this phase clearly lives in the polarized phase. I mean, it follows this boundary very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, so presumably it's, it's coexistent with that state. We can't see it because, well, resistance goes to zero, but also the, the, um, the susceptibility measurement also goes diamagnetic at this transition. But the fact that it follows this boundary suggests that it's coexistent is what I would guess. But we don't know for sure. Now, I, I think this also alludes to your earlier question about what happens above the transition. So uh, let me see if I remember. So this field polarized state actually persists to something like 15 or 20 Kelvin. So if I remember correctly, this boundary also follows. So if you're at higher temperature, although don't quote me on that, I think that's true that if we, we might have some data here a higher temperature that suggests that, you know, the boundary shown here in transport data, for instance, is followed and looks similar to what happens here. Meaning above TC, you're in this polarized phase. That's the and, best, best and, I can say. Do you see the strong down, is there the strong peak in the resistivity, do you think, uh, in the polarized phase? Uh, uh, there's a, has the condo effect disappeared? Do you think at that at, the, at those? Yeah, I, I don't think we have enough data to say. Hmm. But can I ask just a slightly different question? What do you have an explanation or a, a speculation as to why uh, this high field uh, phase appears at that particular field angle? No idea. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's somewhat similar to. Uh, I'm not going to go to the slide, but if you remember the STM data, the cleave plane is this 0, 1, 1. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhere around that angle. 0, 1, 1, okay. Yeah. So I, I think it's Lebed that has a theory that suggests uh, that this is a, a 2D superconductor. And so you might imagine that if, if you're right along the field, right along these this natural plane that you might have some kind of 2D behavior, but I'm not sure the data is completely consistent with that. Does that link to anything in the structure that you showed us earlier where we had the two um, chains of tellurium and uranium? Uh, here, let me go back to this. So that was this picture here. So this plane here is, is sort of B to C, but it's not exactly that angle. It's a bit steeper. You see that it's closer to C than B. But otherwise there's, 
as far as we know, there's nothing special about that angle. Now it is known in the other uranium compounds that uh, you know th there are different uh, types of magnetic fluctuations and in, in when you get to a certain field angle, um, you kind of optimize one fluctuation and suppress the other. And that's thought to, for instance, strengthen pairing, which is related to that particular, let's say longitudinal fluctuation while suppressing the transverse one that's, that's, that's perpendicular to it. Maybe there's something like that happening here, but we don't even understand even at ambient conditions what the, the exact fluctuations are. I mean, there's INS data now that's suggesting uh, antiferromagnetic fluctuations with a certain Q vector, but I, I don't think it's completely conclusive yet. Thank you. I noticed Hawke has his hand raised. Uh, so would you like to ask your question, Hawke? Of course, thank you. Uh, this talk has been really, really stimulating. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, for this system, the irreducible representations of the point group, I think, are all one-dimensional. So if you have spin orbit coupling, you couldn't have broken that reversal symmetry with a single transition. So it's actually very satisfying that you get this split transition. Um, right. But the fact that they are very close, that means that you are very close to the limit where you could have ignore the spin orbit coupling and therefore you had some kind of triplet SO3 breaking up down reversal symmetry. And I'm just wondering, is this uh, is this the current thinking? So if you if you take that limit when these two transitions merge and then you do your group theory and it becomes one of the irreps of the of the fac uh, the factorized group, does the state that you get is it consistent with all the other evidence uh yeah that's a good point um i'm not sure that's what daniel was doing but it's worth considering this limit even if you know it's not really that limit because physically you seem to be very very close to it yeah so it might be very enlightening i remember when we were starting to think about land and nickel carbon too which is very similar scenario. We also thought that we thought, well, spin orbit coupling is probably important, but then how can we break the reverse asymmetry? And then we thought, well, we must be in this limit. And we said there might be a split transition, but it might be almost impossible to see. This one, in this case, you see it. So that kind of analysis might be very enlightening, I think. I anyway, it's fascinating. I'll, actually. I'll bring it up to Daniel. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know how to lower my hand, but I know how to <laughs> mute. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I've got an eye on the time. Um, I don't need to be picking up your door for either. So I think we're, we're I think if there are more questions, then please um, ask now. Write something in the chat. If not, I think we've probably come to a, a, a natural end. And if we could all just uh, thank uh, Jean-Pierre again. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you very much. So I remind everybody that the next um, talk uh, will be in half an hour's time. That's 9 at 9 p.m. UK time. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing everybody then to uh, hear um, Capital Nick uh, might have some more to say on this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>